Okay, good morning. This is the first of six uh, monthly videos that I'm going to do for my friends and my students. It's uh, going to replace the frequent, maybe too frequent travel that I've done over the last years. And today we're going to talk about a pretty popular topic, and that is concerns what to offer your horse so he understands that you don't want him to be so heavy and so crowding and so pushy. Uh, many of you have realized that when he's this way on the ground, he's also rather heavy under saddle and heavy in your hands on your hackamore reins or your, uh, whether it's your full bridle or your rope and halter. They get heavy when you pull and I'm going to try to explain the best way I've figured out how to discourage that behavior without um, correcting him for it. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that because there's been a tremendous upsurge in the last 20 years of people who are learning and working hard to learn how to correct their horses. But uh, I'm going to try to present it in a way that will have people understand there's another way to relate to a horse, which is setting him up to succeed so corrections aren't necessary. Um, it always feels better to be told, good job, that a girl, <laughs> that a boy, you know, nice job, whether you're a person or a puppy or a, a young horse, it's, it really feels good when you know you did the right thing and that even a try was, uh, seen and um, acknowledged, appreciated. Uh, this place right here in the pasture that I just cleared, I spent a year doing it in my spare time, is where we're going to do these uh, discussions. We'll have these discussions right here for the next six months. Um, the th last Sunday of the month at 10 in the morning, uh, weather permitting change locations if need be. But um, that's just to orient you and questions. Uh, if you have questions during the month and your trial and error is something that you'd like help with, feel free to write to me at ridewell, one word, R-I-D-E-W-E-L-L -L, at lesliedesmond.com. I'll read all those <clears throat> and include them uh, where they fit as much as possible in the monthly discussions. I want to tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity right now to thank all the people that helped me get to this spot, right here on this log, because you don't get somewhere, well, you don't get too far on your own anyway, I found out. You can do your best, but you really do need help. And I'll thank at this moment the people who helped me. Uh, the list is long, but... Um, it was uh, thanks to Buck Brannaman and his mentors, three of them, Tom Dorrance and Ray Hunt and Bill Dorrance, who really got me to see a better way to do things. And when I left Massachusetts in 1990, that's what I was after. It's been a fairly long road since then. But uh, I've stopped traveling for the most part, and that feels very good and the ability to use this technology which I'm not very good at yet um, to communicate is also a real relief because now I can spend time with my own horses who have gotten quite old I really actually haven't gotten to spend much time with my horses so um, I'm gonna do that now and I'll actually show them to you next month they're in their 20s and uh, I don't have a colt anymore but We'll see what happens in the future. For the moment, we're going to return now to the discussion of what to do to lighten up the uh, heaviness and to mostly eliminate the heaviness if you can plan for it. Eliminate the heaviness in the horses that you handle. And there are three things that I've noticed everywhere I go. It doesn't matter whether it's a show barn or a ranch or a backyard somewhere. Uh, Pretty much everybody involved with horses 
feels attracted to the face and attracted to the head for various reasons. Many, many times just to put a halter on and go somewhere or to give them a friendly pat or feed them something or just acknowledge their acknowledgement of you. Um, this is a thing over time that if it's done well is really a nice way of enhancing a relationship. If it's done without care paid to the effect that this socialization has on the horse, you end up with a horse that gets rather heavy on the left shoulder and you end up with a horse that has he, if he's been hand fed, he's likely to think that he's rewarded for coming into your space. He's rewarded for crowding, so to say. Um, if you look at it from his point of view, and he's in the middle of one apple or carrot, just pushing it down there fast as he can. He knows you have a few more, or perhaps there are other horses around. He's going to want to move in for that next one. And often, in the course of a horse's lifetime, they're well rewarded for that. And by being hand-fed and rewarded for coming closer, it's very hard for them to understand the corrections and sometimes quite firm punishment that, uh, that people can offer. Sometimes the people that feed out of one hand will knock him back with the same hand or slap his face. I say this with great respect. I also used to hand feed horses. Um, I'll just say that it's a lot more effective for the relationship if you could just kind of lob the food in there, toss it over the fence or drop it at their feet instead of giving them the idea that for crowding you there's actually a payoff. And the payoff is something to eat and Lord knows there's no end to what they feel they can digest. So. <clears throat> Let's just assume that for the moment, a lot of horses are hand fed, or if not hand fed, there's certainly a lot of hand feeding behavior and affection offered at the head, neck, and shoulders consistently by trainers and grooms and vets and vet techs and owners and passers by, and everybody loves to be around a horse's face. So I'm gonna suggest that there could be a way to do it that would be it would enhance your relationship and improve your ride as well because there's nothing worse than getting on a horse who you pick up your reins and you either get a dead response or a flight response. Uh, when the feet are not in your control, they're really not in your control whether they're stuck or whether they're running. So the way that I found is to offer the horse affection and offer the horse attention, offer the horse instruction, farther back on his body, just the way the mother will actually give attention to her foal's rump and rib cage and the back between his withers and his tail. Mother, when the foal is nursing, has a lot of access to the back end of a foal. And she educates him. He's, she's not just scratching and licking him. There's more of an education that goes on because she actually moves him around. And. Um, so I found out that if you want to socialize with your horse and you are farther back, I don't mean at the shoulder, I mean pretty much with your hip where your stirrup would hang, you'll find that that horse will reach clear around and you don't really at that point, if you start that young enough, you don't need to then work on teaching the horse to flex laterally because he's already got it. That's part and parcel of saying hello. Um, so if you do this on both sides on your younger horses or as you retrain ones that are brought to you for training, I found out that it's really, really beneficial because what happens when a horse looks hard left or hard right is that that inside shoulder, if you're not blocking it, will also come up. It will get lighter. That part of the, that part of the shoulder carriage is going to get lighter as he reaches for you back by his wither. And unless he's got something wrong with him, he should re be able to reach you all the way back to your hip. I mean, they get flies off the center of their back, for heaven's sakes. A gelding can get a fly off his own sheath. A mare can bite clear back underneath her hind legs as well. So there's really no problem with the flexibility in these horses unless we limit it by our need to stand right in their eye. Now, I want to talk for a moment about their eyes because they pretty much have their eyes located where our ears are, leaving the front of their head um, 
available for thinking and uh, looking good. Um, this bilateral vision is really tied to their survival the way it is with other types of flight animals. Your grazing animals are set up to see pretty much a 360 diaspora just by a short shift of a hip left or right or a, a shift in their neck left or right. They can pretty much see clear around them both sides. And because our way of keeping them has changed so much for hundreds of generations of horses now, it's changed so much. I don't know whether it's really altered the instinct. I'm not a, I don't study horses from an academic point of view, I don't think, but I can notice that horses that spend a lifetime in stalls waiting for people pressing into a gate or pressing into a stall wall with their heads out above four or five foot opening, standing heavily on the forehand and waiting for attention at the head and neck, they start to develop behavior that isn't really too horse-like. They develop behavior that's more dog-like, um, forward, affectionate, um, and after a while kind of immune to dismissal. They don't wave off anymore the way they do as colts. They need to be pushed off, or you take a flag or a whip or the end of your popper and you charge them out of there somehow. Um, I like horses to be a little lighter and more responsive than that. The only reason I don't use the word respectful is because it's human behavior that creates this crowding tendency. Um, <clears throat> I've had I won't say arguments, because it's not the way to go about it, but the I've been overloaded at times with discussion from people who insist that horses are pushy. I mean, really insistent. And it's true, many of them are, but they didn't come in that way. I've sometimes offered people uh, who are sure of this to go and uh, get into some herd of colts that's out in, say, Kentucky or out and go find a herd of Mustangs and approach them on foot somewhere out in the hills. They're not really pushy if, unless they're taught to be pushy. There's a reward factor that is um, very much a part of what comes back to you in the saddle because the neck and shoulder that is pushed on for three years before a rein passes up that shoulder groove could well be qualified as a dull neck. And you want to have, I think, it's it's a lot more effective to have a neck that's responsive and reins that mean something before the bit has to come tight. I, I would prefer to start referring now in our discussion to the way Bill used the word feel and release. What Bill talked about and showed me so much, just such important detail, and I'll admit it went so far over my head years ago when I was actually in front of him trying to learn this. I really didn't understand what he was talking about very well. And there were just a few videos that we got of him, which I still have in a box. But the idea is that if you release the rein or the lead rope in your groundwork down that shoulder groove, the horse will come up to that sensation. Now that's on a neck that has not been dull. It's on a neck that is still kind of, you might call it, unspoiled or virgin territory. He hasn't been overstimulated there unless he's been hand fed and kind of kept as a pet and rewarded for crowding and then pushed back all over the head neck and shoulders for being too close too often before he's educated well enough to be a riding horse so that's the one thing i wanted to say about leaving that part out of the socialization the tendency to crowd the tendency to kind of show so much affection and hug and kiss their faces or do it such constant in such a constant way that they really think that's what their job is. Very questionably fair to teach a horse a job whether you mean to or not and then tell him he's, his job isn't needed anymore. So when you slap them and push them for this crowding, it becomes very confusing. All right. That point now made, I want to say that on the older horses that are approached on the left only, you'll find <clears throat> in 
many of them, that the right hip is offset. There is an imbalance as they stand often, and there's an imbalance as they slow down. There's an imbalance when they stop, when they're at pasture. There's an imbalance as they socialize with other horses, and often you'll find that the default on a horse that is socialized the way I was just mentioning, you'll find that there's a weaker hind end, you'll find that there's trouble taking both leads and swapping leads in a fluid way, even on their own sometimes. So the lightness that we seek has to start, I think, with the lightness that we, that we offer them and the lightness and respect for the way they need to function, which is to carry themselves and a, a load, if they have one, in a, in a balanced, dynamic way across two diagonals, ever-changing. They, they go from back to forward and from left to right. But if the right hip is not engaged fully and with an equal sureness that the left hip is engaged, and I'm talking now as a default when they're out on their own or when they're in the stall or when they're in a cross tie getting ready to be settled. When you can see that they're heavy on the left shoulder constantly and kind of bent left and the right hip out behind or sometimes the back feet tucked in behind each other, I don't know if you can see this. I'm too far away from the camera to see what I'm actually doing on the screen. But my preference is always to have a horse square up so that you have a leg at each corner, like your dining room table. It's not that easy to prepare a meal and serve it to six people on a tripod. You're going to have some imbalance there. A well-balanced stool is one thing, but the kind of imbalance that comes from the avoidance of uh, anything, let's just say anything. That's a long list of what horses avoid when they assume an imbalanced posture. But let's just say, if you want that horse balanced, perhaps start working him from both sides, the left and the right. And, uh, and in order to get to the left and right on some of these older horses, it might be better to go around the back because Many of them are so sure that they should be only seeing you out of the left eye that they won't allow you to cross in front easily to the right. And it's this type of thing that I want to bring into the minds of um, people who work with young students, like let's say your pony club and 4-H groups, horsemen's associations, you have your um, breed groups, youth groups that get together, summer camps, whoever it is is dealing with children and horses, your, your input is so important. And the needs of the horse, the more that young people recognize and children can be aware of the needs of the horse, they take it on full bore. I've, I've seen it, I did it myself when I was young and I've seen my students do it young and old all my whole life. So I think that I'm going to try to emphasize the importance of spending more time at the back of a horse, spending more time, let's just say when you pick their feet, why not start at the right hind? I've been around horses that you can't even get to the right hind foot actually, older horses. A lot of um, horses that are even in performance at, at quite significant levels of recognition. Right hind foot is the last one many people get to and it's the worst one to do. Um, I like to start, I, I trim horses myself, and have taken care of feet for a long time myself, my own, sometimes others. But um, I find it's better to start on the back feet because the horse bears most of his weight naturally on the front. And that way, if you set the back feet up in a, in a, in a, in a trim and an alignment that is sufficient for stability in the hips, then when you get to the front feet, which carry more weight, if there's more correction or there's a thrush problem or there's a abscess problem to address the horse is already set up behind and so the work on the fronts isn't so uh, doesn't come back to be such a difficulty when you work on the hinds so I reverse the order of some things I start on the right hind I encourage my students to offer their grooming, their affection, their haltering, all of the removal and 
the, the, the putting on and the removal of tack from the right side as well as the left, perhaps even more on the right to start with because many of these horses are going to encounter in their life um, a preponderance of right-handed people. So, yes, the equipment is set up that way and there are historic reasons for that. Um, more and more you're seeing equipment that is made that is useful on two sides and you can always turn your rope halters inside out so that they can be applied and used on the left side or on the right side. But you can buy them too and you can do whatever you want. But the main thing is before you punish a horse that is heavy in front, we have to really take a moment and look at our contribution to his thought that he should be heavy in front. Uh, they're set up naturally to be heavy in front. I mean, if they weren't balanced in this way, I guess when they went to eat, their butt would stick up in the air like a seesaw. So the heaviness in front that they have enables them to defend themselves with their feet in a group. It enables them to reach deeply underneath themselves for a, a quick turn or a fast stop. Their agility is unsurpassed as long as we don't minimize and hinder it by the way we shape them to believe that we need them to operate. What happens is, I've found that we want a horse on the under saddle that's quite different than the one we sometimes prepare on the ground. We want to, we get a pet on the ground for two, three, four years and then by the time we're up on his back and able to go, we want to have more life or more lightness. You don't want to feel like your rein is tied off to a tree. Look at that, right here. Um, so now, there are three things that I would like to talk about your rein control and the way to Be sure that your groundwork does not thwart or go against and contradict your intention when you're in that saddle. Um, let's just say a horse eats grass. That's his main job. Now, for people who keep their horses in stalls, travel all over the world and in the country, horses in and out of trailers, and it shows your horse still does want to eat off the ground. And... Um, I'm not going to try to influence the way people make their decisions, but I'll just say when you keep the horse's instincts in mind, it can lead you to be more observant. And I'll just say that for myself, um, I've given up mangers. I've given up feeding off the ground. I've, I've started to pay attention quite closely to what happens to uh, the alignment of the jaw, the use of the pole, the efficiency of the hips, the looseness of the whole configuration. The whole animal needs to eat with his head down. That's the way he was set up anyway. It's not to say that it's wrong to feed them in another way, but there is an impact. There is an effect. So I'm thinking that it's a good idea to pay attention to this. So that when you start collecting them off grass, instead of pulling their head to move their feet, so that they learn with your lead rope that pull means go, perhaps you could step into the hip and walk behind them and have them follow you. Because when they move a back foot, they generally will move a front foot on the same side. And by doing that, they'll pick their head up because they won't step on their own lip. So, Maybe change the idea that you would look at a horse and try to yank him off the ground into your space. Give him more line to follow you, go behind him, and then go somewhere. The less confrontation we have, generally speaking, the less confrontation they'll offer. That's what I've seen. So if pull doesn't mean go, then it's a lot easier for the adjustment of your reins to mean other things. There's nothing worse than being on a horse that thinks pull means go unless you're at a racetrack. And most of us aren't riding race horses or timber horses as fast as they can go. That's a nice thing when they do. You want to pull harder or stay on better. You know they're going to speed up. 
not that that's the intention in the training, but that tends to be what happens. So, for example, the re-education of your off-track thoroughbreds is one of the main things those horses need to learn is the pull with a snapple bit doesn't mean take off. And that requires some, <laughs> it requires a rider anyway. Good one. So if we would like to have a front end available, we can't think about pulling it to lightness. We want to think about releasing it to lightness. So I'm not quite sure how much time I have left here. I think Facebook told me I can only talk for 30 minutes, and I was planning on talking as long as I wanted, actually. Uh, but maybe this is enough to think about for now. I don't know. Um, I'm not quite sure how to do this because I never did it before. I'm about five feet from the screen. I can't read a thing, but I see a lot of little indicators there that I should be doing something. Not sure what. I'm going to talk for another minute to finish this point, and then maybe I end this for the moment. Um, <clears throat> I'll post it so that other people can see it. Feel free to share it. I hope it's helpful. Um, the lightness in the forehand, a real bilateral lightness, is going to depend on a balanced hip, which depends on <laughs> alignment, stifles that are well aligned, hocks that are well aligned and straight under the stifle in the hip, a line of support. You certainly wouldn't live or you certainly wouldn't build or live in a house that is set up the way a lot of the back ends on these horses are that I see. I will grant you some of it is genetics, but most of it is the way we keep them. And when you get a consistently high inside wall on a lot of these feet, it tends to make the front feet toe in and the back feet toe out. So without getting too much into the province of the journeyman farriers and the barefoot specialists, many of whom are many of whom are superb in their, in their area, both in the shoeing and in the trimming. I'm a dubber. I do my own. I help other people. My students have learned uh, a lot about trimming. I have some students that are absolutely, I think, world class in barefoot hoof care. I'm very proud of anyone who picks up a set of tools and tries and starts. And I've got several that are very skilled and have come to see that the alignment that you can attain from front to back and from light, right to left across those diagonals has everything to do with your ability to set a horse up to stand properly on four feet. So we can't really talk about offset pelvises and crooked bodies and tight adductors and psoas muscles that are different lengths and different positions and hips that are dropped and the whole catastrophe of misalignment is not going to happen with a change of equipment. A whole horse has to really be looked at and the way we keep them. For the purposes of today, I'm just going to wrap it up by suggesting that we socialize with our horses in a more conscious way, try to keep the, uh, the sort of pet puppy and hand-fed dog or hand-fed horse practices to a minimum so that they stop looking at us as treat dispensers and um, rubbing posts and things to kind of push around out of their way. We don't want to be dismissed by just because we haven't got an apple or a carrot to offer. And so as you begin to adjust these ways if in the next month, if you try this for a few months, those of you who might find some value in this recommendation, I think you'll find that your horses will begin to square up more readily, and as you begin to shift your operations to the right side, they'll begin to balance in their ability to uh, perhaps go to the right a little more freely. Um, without a doubt, body work can be very helpful with horses that have only been handled on one side. Without a doubt, horses with ill-fitting saddles or um, let's say a type of farrier that hasn't been particularly well suited to the use of that animal. Certainly some horses 
would do better without shoes, and some might do better with them. Certainly have to say that. But uh, for now, I think to just focus on having a horse um, be more balanced and more respectful as a result of your respect would be a good place to start. Um, I'm going to turn this off and see what all these notifications are that I can read, and I hope this has been helpful. If I have time and um, there are any questions up there that I can answer, I'll do that this morning. Otherwise, a reminder, the email to connect with me is ridewell at lesliedesmond.com. Thank you very much. This has been a first time and enjoyable. I hope we can do this again. Thank you.